Welcome back to Knowledge is Kings, guys. I'm Kings, and today I'm going to be going over everything you need to know to pour an epoxy river table without any problems. Now, this is more a guide to pouring and finishing epoxy, but I will be brushing over the whole table process as well. Let's get to it. The first thing I need to do is find a good slab to use for the table. I have a good cutoff scrap piece here that will make a nice coffee table, I think. Before we can pour epoxy onto the wood, we need to do some work for it first. So if you're going to be making tables out of thick slabs like this, I highly recommend getting some sort of track saw. These slabs, even the little ones, are very heavy. This is eucalyptus, which is a very, very dense wood, and I don't recommend this type if it's your first project, as it requires a lot of sanding because it's so dense. Anyway, with the heft of these slabs, moving it around and carrying it to the table saw is not very convenient, so a track saw is the way to go. This slab is very thick. I think it was two and a half inches thick at the start, so I needed to use my largest track saw to cut all the way through. Once it has been sized to a rough size, we need to work on the edges. Here are some of the wheels you can use to clean up the edges of the slab. The two smaller wire wheels can be placed in a drill if you don't have a grinder. The other wheels need a grinder to use. These are the types that I will be using. The sanding flap is good for flattish areas where you need to lightly or slowly remove material. The wire cup wheel is great for removing loose debris without removing wood. If you really press hard with this one, it will start burning the wood, so you need to be careful. The third one, that is blue, is for when you want to remove a lot of material fast. I will not be using that wheel for this table. Before using the grinder, I want to remove the really loose stuff around the edges. You can see there is a bunch that I can just scrape off with my hands. If you skip this step of cleaning the slab, your table will most likely break in half when you're done. The epoxy will bind itself to the loose stuff, and the loose stuff will eventually break away from the table, leaving you with two expensive, useless half tables. To start, I clamp the slab to the sawhorses before I start banging on it with the chisels so it doesn't move all around on me. I just try to remove everything that seems somewhat loose or that I think might break off in the future. You just need to sort of play it by ear. I can't tell you exactly you need to remove this or you need to remove that, but you'll get the feel for it as you start working on your piece. No need to grab your nicest chisels for this step either. I use my oldest chisels that I don't mind beating on. Once I have the big stuff off, I switch to the wire wheel to finish it up and get all the loose debris off. On the other side, I like the look of the really dark wood so I don't remove it, but I still scrape off the loose bits. You can see the wire wheel does a great job of keeping the wood intact while still removing anything that's loose. Be sure to wear something to filter out all the dust that this process creates. I'm not sure, but I think all the tiny particles of dust are toxic in some way. Once I have it cleaned up, it's time to cut it in half. Again, the best way to do this is with a track saw. If you don't have one, you could cut it in half freehand with a circular saw, as we will be cutting it to its final dimension once it comes out of the epoxy form, so it doesn't need to be perfect yet. Before we add these two halves to the form, we need to make the form. I grabbed a couple of pieces of melamine from the scrap pile, and of course it has a bunch of glue on the back. That's okay, I'll just remove that with a chisel. On second thought, maybe I'll just leave the glue on there and I'll make sure that's the bottom of the form. So leaving it how it was, I sent it through the table saw and cut it to size. Then I send the other piece of melamine through the saw set at three inches to make the sides of the form. Before assembling the form, we need to cover it in house wrap tape. I thoroughly clean the board with water and a rag before trying to apply the tape. I want great adhesion, which means I can't have dust all over the surface. Then I apply the tape with around an eighth inch overlap on each piece. 
Once I have the sides of the form cut to length, I apply the tape to those pieces as well. I like to push all the pieces together and apply the tape this way. I think this saves the tape as the tape that would overhang on the tops then goes on the next piece instead of being wasted. Then I just cut them apart. Melamine doesn't handle screws all that well without splitting, so I pre-drill all the holes before adding the screws. Once it is all screwed together, I need to apply caulk to all the inside corners. When you apply this, make sure to do a controlled steady motion without stopping or allowing any gaps in the caulk. Then just using your finger, press the caulk into the corner. With the form ready, it's time to set our slab on it and decide how we want it to look. I just play around with it for a little bit to get the look that I like. This one was pretty easy as it's so small and only two pieces, but I've done very big ones that take a while to get a position that I end up liking. Then I just mark the form on the slabs so I know where to cut them so that they stay in this orientation and so they fit into the form. I trim them up on the miter saw. If they are too big for the miter saw, I use the track saw again. Once they are cut, I drop them into the form. And there is no need to wait for the caulk to set up either. If you have done it correctly, it will not leak. I actually prefer to set the wood in the form while the caulk is not set up so it doesn't hold my slab away from the edges or hold it up at all. I'd rather the slab push the caulk down so it fits tight against the side as possible. The farther it is from the sides of the form, the more epoxy you will end up wasting. Wood floats on epoxy, so I need to clamp the pieces down, but I don't want to epoxy my clamps in, so I made some little blocks of 2x4 cutoffs wrapped in house wrap tape that I can place in between my clamps and the slabs. The house wrap tape works perfectly as it doesn't need form release applied for the epoxy to come off. Now before we pour, we need to figure out how much epoxy we need. Here is my process. I mark every inch across the table. These marks are where I measure across the gap. I write down each measurement as I go. I add up all these measurements and then divide by the number of measurements I took. This will give me the average width of the gap. I take this number in inches and multiply it by the thickness of the slab and also by the length of the table, all in inches. The answer that I got of about 499 is 499 cubic inches. If I divide that number by 1.805, I get that I need 276.5 ounces. Or alternatively, I could divide the 499 by 231, which is how many cubic inches are in a gallon, and get that I need just over two gallons. I will then make two and a quarter gallons because I always lose a lot to the perimeter of the table and to any knots and voids that soak up a bunch of the epoxy. So I have epoxy in 55 gallon drums because I make a lot of epoxy tables, 
Also, I sell my own epoxy, which is available on my website, kingswoodshopusa.com, and I'll leave a link in the description if you want to try some. I had this made for me specifically because for the deep pour, I wanted a very slow hardening epoxy so I can control the heat more easily. So the buckets that I use for mixing the epoxy are food grade buckets I picked up at the hardware store. I use the food grade ones because they are white so it's easy to see what color I'm mixing into the epoxy. The blue and orange buckets make it hard to tell. My deep pour epoxy is a 2 to 1 ratio, so I take the 2.25 gallons that I need and divide by 3 and then multiply by 2 to get that I need 1.5 gallons of resin. Once I have the resin I need, I just fill up the hardener to my total amount, which is 2 and a quarter gallons. When mixing epoxy, you need to make sure it is very well mixed. You do not want unmixed epoxy as it will never cure and you will have a half hard, half mushy mess. So I mix it for probably about five minutes, making sure to scrape the sides and mixing at sort of a slow speed as I don't want to introduce any more air bubbles into the mix than I need to. When I feel like I have mixed it enough, I add coloring. Now for tables that I don't want to be translucent, I use powder pigments. Here I'm using mostly blue with just a hint of purple. You can get some really nice different colors by adding small amounts of another color. If you're making your own, don't be afraid to try different things. This is just an intro into epoxy, but you can get different results when you mix different colors in as well. But that will be a topic for another video. Also, if you want anywhere from transparent to opaque colors without any metallic or cloudy appearance, use alcohol inks for coloring. I don't use those a lot, but there are some different effects you can only get with liquid pigments. When I have them fully mixed, I pour them into smaller buckets so I can put them into my vacuum chamber. Now this step isn't crucial, especially if your table is opaque, which is what I would suggest doing for your first project as it's more forgiving, but I like to remove as many air bubbles as possible just to make sure my table is bubble free. This epoxy cures very slowly with a full cure in about seven days, but it will get thick enough to stop bubbles moving in about three days, which normally is enough time to let bubbles come out naturally, but I like to hedge my bets. Also, if you're pouring this more than two inches or so thick, it will cure faster. And if you are pouring more than two and a half inches thick, you will need to cool the table as it cures with either a bunch of fans all around the table or portable air conditioners cooling it down. Otherwise, it will cure way too fast and ruin the table. After I think enough bubbles have been removed, I pour it into the table. And of course, I forgot to turn the camera on for the first bucket, but for the second bucket, I pour in in the same way. I pour the epoxy somewhat slowly onto the edge of the wood instead of into the middle of the epoxy, as this would force air into the mixture. I also pour some epoxy directly into any large voids to make sure they get filled. If, like this void, it doesn't go all the way through to the bottom, it won't ever fill up by itself as the epoxy levels out. I do the same on the edges as well. I have maybe a quart of epoxy left over at this point, and I'm going to reserve it until tomorrow. Okay, it's tomorrow, and I've spread epoxy over almost the entire surface of the table. And this is to make sure I don't get any weird discoloration because some of the wood absorbed some of the epoxy and some didn't. As you can see, the level of the epoxy seems to have fallen, and this is because now the epoxy has found all the hidden empty spots it can and filled around the edges. I take the reserve epoxy and I mix more purple into it, and I add it to the table creating a pattern of sorts and topping off any of the voids as necessary. I didn't end up liking the look, so I ended up just mixing the added epoxy in. One thing I need to mention is if the bucket you are pouring from is the same bucket that you mix the epoxy in, do not, I repeat, do not scrape the sides of the bucket to get every last drop out. You will end up scraping in unmixed epoxy that's stuck to the sides and it will baffle you as to why you have goopy spots when you mixed it for an hour.
If you dumped it into a different bucket as I did, so that it would fit into my vacuum chamber, you can scrape those buckets clean without any worries, but I still wouldn't because the more stuck to the sides, the easier it will be to pull out the cured epoxy from the bucket and reuse the bucket. Also, if you're gonna reserve epoxy overnight, pour it into a different bucket than what you mix it in. This is how easily it should be to pull the epoxy cured out of the bucket. Okay, so it's been seven days now and it's time to take the table out of the form. When I'm removing the screws from the form, I double check to make sure I actually take all the screws out because I missed one once and thought the epoxy was just really sticking hard and I ended up breaking the form before I realized that there was a screw. And that's a mistake I only want to make once. I just tap the sides with a dead blow hammer to get them to release. For the bottom, I need to use a wedge I made from some plywood to pry the bottom off. As you can see, it pops right off and this is without form release. But if you were worried, you can use form release and it would come off even easier. I personally only use form release when I'm using silicone forms, especially if the forms are intricate like making epoxy chess pieces. This is more a video of how to work with the epoxy, so I'll not be using a flattening jig to flatten this. I'm just going to send it through my 52 inch planer, but I'll do a video in the future of how to build a really nice flattening jig and how to use it. As this is going through the planer, you can see the caulk is smearing on the table of the planer. I only bring it up because I just wanted to bring the point home that the caulk does not need to be cured before you place the slab in the form. And it never got a chance to cure as I poured the epoxy before it could, and still the form did not leak. Now that the table is flat and has lost some thickness, you will notice some little holes have appeared in the, in the voids. As the epoxy flows into the small voids, air can get trapped and you won't be able to see them until after it's planed down. To fill these holes, I could use my art and table epoxy, which cures a lot faster in only about a day, but for me that is too slow. So what I am using here in my cup is a UV cured resin. I fill a syringe with a UV cure resin that I have already added color to, and then I grab my container of needles. These needles have flat tips, which is nice so I don't accidentally inject myself with epoxy. I'm not sure what that will do, but I also don't want to find out. Once the tip is on, I make sure to close the, whoops, put that back in there. I just close the, ah. Forget it, I'll just move this over here and chuck it across the room once the camera's off. The process here is simple enough. Just stab the needle into each hole and fill it in. When they have enough in, I use a UV flashlight or my cordless UV light to cure the resin. It only takes a few seconds before they are ready to be sanded down. The flashlight is nice because it's cheap and does the job, but it's very small and it takes a little while for the epoxy to cure. The cordless UV light is very powerful and cures the resin very fast, but it is very expensive for what it is. $400 for a UV light. Not really worth it unless you do this a lot. I did try some UV lights that cover a lot of area and were pretty cheap but they didn't work. They needed to be pointing at the resin for a long time for the resin to cure. So I guess they do work, it just takes a long time. Too long for me. The cordless UV light is so strong that if you have it pointed at the wood for too long, it will start to darken the wood. I have another shallow but larger area that was low on resin, but I can do this same thing here. Here, for obvious reasons, I don't need to use the needle to put the epoxy in. I can just dump it in from the cup although I do use the needle to push the resin into the small crack on the side. One thing you need to remember while using UV cure resin is that keeping it out in the normal light will cure it slowly, and you cannot do this in the sunlight at all as it will very quickly cure the resin. So if you have any colored resin left over that you don't want to throw away, keep it in a light proof box.
Once I have all the holes filled in, I want to rip the table to its final dimensions before I start sanding. I again use my track saw to take as little off as possible, but I need to remove the epoxy that went around the edges when it was in the form. Once the two sides are parallel, I use a square with my track to square the ends up and cut it to length. I have already done a round of sanding with 80 grit sandpaper here, and I have a lot more to go. So if you've seen any of my other videos, you know I hate sanding, so I normally just skip over it. But when it comes to these epoxy tables, sanding is so critical to it turning out well that I don't want to just gloss over it. When you sand epoxy, and when you sand very dense wood like this, I sand with each sandpaper grit three times. Once moving the sander vertically, once moving the sander horizontally, and once moving the sander diagonally over the whole piece. Always keep the sander moving, especially on the epoxy. I also do not sand the epoxy on all the passes. The epoxy will sand a lot easier than the wood, and if I am not careful, I can make a valley in the epoxy. So I spend more time on the wood, but I also need to make sure that all the previous scratches from the sandpaper during the last grit in the epoxy are removed. In between each sanding grit, and when I get past 180 grit in between each pass, I spray the table lightly with water. This does two things. One, it raises the grain on the wood so my final product will be super smooth, and two, it takes a lot more dust away from the last sanding. This is very important for the epoxy. Dust from the last sanding pass can sort of clump together and put unwanted scratches in the epoxy. The higher the grit, the more I will wash the dust away. This is even with using a vacuum sander that does an amazing job at dust collection. Once I have it all sanded to 240 grit, I put whatever edge treatment I want on the edge. In this case, I'm doing a chamfer. Once the edge treatment is done, I sand the whole thing to 320 grit, and I sand the end grain to two grits higher. Sanding the end grain further than the rest of the table will stop the end grain from absorbing more finish, so it won't look darker than the rest of the surface. Before I do the last sanding on the bottom, I need to install the legs. Now you could surface mount the legs, but if they are inset into the table, it really gives it a very clean look. And again, this video is more about the epoxy process, so I'll cover this pretty quickly. But to route it in the table legs, I make a jig that is 1 16th inch bigger in all dimensions than the part I want to insert. I have found that if I make a jig that is the exact size and I put the legs in, and then I need to take the legs out at some point, if there's any shrinkage in the wood, that wood can tear out when I pull the legs out. So I like to give them a little room. I have my jig marked so I always have it in the same orientation on the corners. Then I temporarily glue the jig to the table and use a router with a brass collar to remove the wood. Once I have the holes from the legs marked, I drill them out with a bit that has some tape on it so I know when to stop. The last thing I want to do is drill through the tabletop. Once the drill dust gets whipped off of the table, I know that the tape has reached the dust and I have drilled far enough. Then I tap the holes so I can put machine thread bolts in them. 
Now I have seen a lot of people using metal inserts that the bolts go into all over the internet. I would advise against using those, especially if you'll be selling this table to someone who may take it apart and put it back together a lot. The metal inserts do not hold as well as tapping the wood. They can strip easier if you aren't putting the bolt in straight. They don't hold up as long as just tapping the wood. The bolt can get stuck in them sometimes and make getting the legs off very difficult and they cost more money. So there really isn't much of an advantage. I'm not sure why they are becoming so popular. Now they do have their uses, but it isn't putting these table legs on. But enough about that. Okay, once I have all the legs drilled and tapped, it's finally time for finish. Now one of my favorite finishes is really expensive and it's a spray on finish and it's tricky to use, but makes for a beautiful tough finish. But as I want this to be a more simple approach, I'll be using Rubio Monocoat. Now this can be pretty expensive too. I think $150 to $180 for a small bottle, but it is incredibly easy to put on and very simple to repair if it gets damaged. To start with this finish, I need to clean the wood with mineral spirits. Do not just dump the mineral spirits onto the table, but wet a rag and brush the table with it. Once the table is completely dry again, we can apply the finish. It's a three to one mixed ratio, so I use syringes to measure each part. It is fast, and this way I don't make any mess by having to pour it from the metal can. These cans are just not made for pouring. Once I have it in a little cup, I mix it thoroughly. You can see I'm not using very much. A little of this stuff goes a long way. I pour the finish on the epoxy itself only because I found that if a pile sits on one spot of the wood for a bit too long, it can get a bit darker than the rest of the wood around it. So I would rather it sit on the epoxy that can't absorb it. I just spread it around using a Bondo spreader. I like using this as it's very soft and flexible and I don't need to worry about it scratching my epoxy. I try not to put more finish on than I need because the next step is removing as much as possible. It is my understanding that the Rubio Monocoat actually has some type of reaction with the wood, which is why you remove all the excess on the surface because the finish sitting on the top won't react with anything. Now, I'm no expert on what the finish is actually doing with the wood, but I can assure you if you don't remove all the excess finish on your table, you will have a very waxy feeling that feels very phony. Whereas if you get it all off, the wood still retains a very nice wood feel. Now I can never get the epoxy to retain a nice wood feel though, for some reason. It always feels just like glass. Oh well. I'm just using rags in a box cloth to remove the excess, getting a new cloth whenever this one has a bunch of finish on it. I need to get a new cloth after each pass until no more finish comes off. Now I'm showing you how you can do this by hand and it will be pretty good for the wood, but to get the best finish on the epoxy, it is best to use some type of polisher. Normally I use this floor polisher, but I won't for now so you can see what it looks like when it's done by hand. As I'm using the rags, I'm pressing pretty hard to try to polish and to get the finish off. Now I always start on the bottom, then I can add the legs on and flip the table over and give the top another final sanding. That way my finished bottom doesn't sit on any surface as it now has legs. If I started on the top, I wouldn't be able to do that. Thank you. 
So I want to make sure the top is absolutely perfect and free from defects, so I rake a light across to help see any shadows. And if I see shadows, that area needs more sanding. Once the wood is perfect, I focus on the epoxy. I want to really polish up the epoxy and make sure there are no deep scratches in it. The epoxy will now get wet sanded up to 600 grit. I do not want to sand the wood all the way up to 600 because from what I understand, the Rubio Monocoat will not react well with the wood if it's sanded too fine because it can't soak in as much as it needs to. Plus, sanding it to that level would be a lot more work. Again, when sanding epoxy, keep the sander moving. When I am done sanding, I just use a heat gun to remove the water that may have absorbed into the wood while wet sanding. I do not want that moisture to get trapped in the wood before I finish it. Now the last thing I do before cleaning this with mineral spirits is to scrape out natural defects that I don't fill with epoxy. The sanding dust from the epoxy will be white and it clogs these little pores and I need to get it out now or they'll get stuck in there forever. I use dental picks and compressed air to clean them out. I don't fill natural small defects like this in with epoxy because it makes the wood part of the table feel more natural, but it's a personal preference thing. The very tiny white in the grain is small enough that it will become invisible once the table has been cleaned with mineral spirits and finished. Now you don't have to be this precise when building a table for yourself because all these little t details take a lot of extra time, but if you're building this for a client, take the time to give them a product that is amazing. Now the top is ready for cleaning. So as I did before, I clean the top with mineral spirits and then I wait for it to dry. Once it is dry, I apply the Rubio Monocoat to the top the same way I did to the bottom. On the edges, I just apply the finish with my finger while wearing gloves. And with that, the table is complete. Now I covered a lot of information and I think I got everything, but if there's anything that you still have questions about, leave me a comment or send me an email. Also, don't forget that I have my epoxy available on my website, kingswoodshopusa.com, if you're interested. I have the deep pour stuff I use here and the tabletop and art epoxy for bar top finishes and smaller projects. Also, let me know if there are any other epoxy projects you wanna know how to do that other videos may not go into enough detail about. That is it for this video. Please leave it a like as it really helps out the channel and consider subscribing so you don't miss out on future videos. My next video is going to be how to build a shed from scratch. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, here's a bonus tip on how to store the Rubio Mono Coat. Now you don't have to do this, but if you don't, when you open the can next time, it will look like this. And you'll have to scrape away all the dry stuff and throw it away and it's like throwing money away.
What I do is put the can of Rubio in my vacuum chamber with the lid just sitting loosely on and vacuum the air out. Do not go over negative 15 inches because any more negative pressure will collapse the can. Then I quickly let the air back in, which forces the lid on and keeps the inside of the can air free so I don't get wasted product in the can. Okay, now I'm done. Okay, one thing I forgot to mention before you go is when you're choosing your slab, before you start using it for the table, check it with a moisture meter. You want it to be below 11%, and I probably wouldn't use it if it was below 7%. So between 7 and 11%, you can use the wood. Otherwise, either let it dry a little more or let it absorb a little moisture. You can either use a Wagner meter like I have here, which is I think like 600 bucks, so that's probably not something you're gonna wanna use unless you do this a lot, or you can get a little push pin meter, which aren't as accurate, but they're a lot cheaper. I think it's like 15 bucks for this little one. Okay, now I'm really done. Oh, I like that.